Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your life coach, mentor coach. And what I do is I help people that are tired of who they are and where they are in life. And this is Gloria, your life coach. I help those who are feeling stuck, struggling with difficulties such as self-doubt, inner judgment, lack of confidence, life transitions, and taking steps forward. And welcome to Life's A Shuffle podcast. Now, you may wonder why it's called Life's A Shuffle. And the reason why we came up with this title was that life is really shuffling. And it doesn't matter where you come from, your background, what age you are, you're shuffling multiple things in life. And the best thing to know in life is everybody faces your struggles and everybody faces what you're going through. But there's hope in learning something about that. So when our guests share their journey, the hope is you learn something in that journey so yourself can navigate the struggles you face, the low self-esteem, the self-confidence. And that's why we call podcast Life's a Shuffle. And throughout this podcast, we share our personal overcoming stories, as well as our guests who shares their personal journey in overcoming their personal struggles. Life's a Shuffle podcast is here to connect like-minded individuals. And thank you for listening to Life's a Shuffle podcast. Hi, this is Gloria, your mindfulness and meditation coach. Welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your mindset, behavior, and positive positive psychology master practitioner and welcome to another episode of life's a shuffle and today we have a special guest and i love guests i love hearing their stories because that's how we connect on a bigger universal world is connecting people and their stories because stories are empowering stories are where the meat is and stories is where we learn the most come on with pittsburgh robert curtsy take it away man tell about your story Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Appreciate you. My name is Robert Kirksey. Uh, I'm a videographer, photographer, and script writer. But most importantly, I'm stepping into my uh, passion and uh, speaking to people with epilepsy and mental disabilities. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I've had epilepsy since I was two years old. So uh, I know a lot about the struggles that that comes with. Um, and in regards to uh, different medications you have to take, uh, different side effects you have from those medications, even in regards to uh, the mental condition of you uh, in times where you're not even having a seizure, you know, uh, sometimes it's just very hard to focus uh, because your brain may be moving a little too fast. And right now I'm speaking uh, specifically for people with epilepsy, um, not always the case for people who just have seizures. So uh, I I don't know, there's a there's a big difference there that a lot of people don't realize, I think. What is the difference? So the difference uh, is epilepsy is the disorder that causes seizures, but seizures is just over electric, over electric activity in the brain. So our, our electric neurons in our, in our brain, they're just overactive and too much is going on at the same time. That's what causes a seizure, and that can be caused by a lot of different things. So that can be caused by, say, you got in a car accident and you had a head injury. That can cause it. Um, say you drunk, you drink too much. You you're you're an alcoholic, and uh, my I'm speaking from a personal experience on that one because my uncle, uh, he's an alcoholic and he he has seizures now. It's to the point where. He has to balance how much alcohol he drinks because the alcohol caused the seizures, right? But at the same time, that alcohol is also controlling the seizures in a way to where he's he's depending on alcohol, which is insane to say and think about. But it's very, very true because if he doesn't drink a certain amount, like if he just completely stops, which he's done before, he will have a seizure. And he said he's had seizures while drinking too. But it's just a fine balance uh, because it, it can get much worse if he just stops cold turkey. So it's it's really it's really weird, but the way the brain works. But he has been diagnosed with epilepsy, though. So his brain activity has became permanent. That that became that's his thing. So the the big difference is one is a disorder that causes the seizures to be permanent and come back reoccurringly, and then one is just a one-time thing maybe you can have a seizure one time 
So you can have a head injury, uh, something's going on in the brain, even if it's just too much stress. You can have a seizure, but not have epilepsy. So mm. the difference is just uh, one's permanent and one is not not permanent. It's just uh, overactivity in the brain at that moment. Hmm. So I, I'm curious, I know you mentioned earlier that this started at a young age for you. Um, kind of give us or tell us, you know, how you navigated through this journey when you were younger to to now. For sure. So, um, I mean, it was a process, to be honest. It's a, definitely a crazy process. But, uh, I mean, it was just, I guess, just God, honestly, to be to be honest, it was just God and the people, the fam, my family, they've always been uh, super supportive of me, even when there was nothing to support. So, uh, you know, just just them and God, to be honest, because, I mean, I've had some hard times uh, when it comes to mentally and emotionally dealing with uh, being that needy kid, if that makes sense. I hated feeling like I needed somebody. I didn't, I'm a very, uh, well, at least I try to be a very independent person. And uh, it always ate me up inside to be that kid that couldn't really be independent. Uh, I was that kid that at the end of the day had to depend on somebody to keep an eye on me because I could have had a seizure at any moment. I mean, when I was younger, my seizures were really bad. I used to have uh, more than one seizure daily. So uh, it was really, really bad when I was younger. So I couldn't uh, be that independent kid that I wanted to be. I had to depend on people. But uh, it it was weird because even though I had to depend on people, I was still introvert. So it was really hard to find somebody that I could trust enough to depend on. Now, eventually I found some friends, you know, that, uh, that I trusted in that way because I always had a good personality. I always had a friendly personality. I was always a good friend to to everyone who who I ever called friends. So uh definitely always attracted people, but then at the same time my disorder uh sent those people running if they didn't if they weren't genuine. So that's like a gift and a curse of of it right there. Um is that it kind of sent the wrong people running fast. I mean they would talk about me, they would laugh at me and I, there was times at a young age where I would laugh with them because I agreed with everything they were saying, every negative thing. And that's that's the crazy part is that mentally and emotionally, sometimes it affects you in the way that you agree with the enemy, if that makes sense. Like uh, everything negative people are saying to you about you, you agree with because you're not really sure what's wrong with you. I mean, at a young age, when I was a kid, I mean, I knew I had epilepsy, of course. But it was so hard to figure out why my brain worked like this. <laughs> I mean, people can tell me every day, you know, you have epilepsy. It's okay. You have, you have epilepsy. But no one really broke it, ever broke it down to me uh, why my brain worked like this. And uh, even when I wasn't having a seizure, um, my brain would just be overactive. It was always so hard for me to uh, focus and uh Sometimes just be in the moment. Uh, it got to the point where in in middle school, I uh, I used to uh, get sent to the corner. Now, one time I got sent because I did. I don't remember what I did, but I got in trouble though. And but in that corner, it was so weird. It was it was almost like I met somebody else. <laughs> it, it, and that sounds crazy, but um, because in that corner, I realized just how introverted I really was. It was to the point where in that corner, I was able to just reconnect with uh, my own brain <laughs> and focus on my work. Cause I, I got everything that I needed to get done, done when I was in that corner alone. And it just speaks to really my whole life because I've always, I've always strived and, and, I know teamwork makes the dream work. I'm a videographer, so I know that for a fact. But I, growing up, I always strived when I was left alone in a quiet room because it was just like, okay, 
now my brain can't do too much. Now I can't think about what Johnny's thinking or what's on Susie's paper or why is the teacher looking at me like that? Like I can't overthink every little thing. That's what happens a lot of times with me. And I know with a lot of different people with epilepsy, a lot of times we're just overthinking the world. <laughs> and yeah. it, it affects us in, in negative ways sometimes. So, you know, um, as I would say, just growing up, it was just a trial and error thing of, okay, what'll work with me? And I'm still figuring it out. I'm 25 and I'm still figuring it all out. And I don't, you know, I, I'm getting closer though, I feel like. I'm getting so much closer. And, and the big reason I feel like I'm getting closer to knowing myself completely is because I'm talking about it. And uh, for so long, I hid this. Oh, man, you don't even know. I didn't talk about this at all to people other than the people who were in my family. And even them, we didn't have those conversations because they already knew. So there was no reason to have these full conversations about what I've been through. But when I start, uh, club, this is why Clubhouse is such a blessing, because when I start finally uh, expressing it and talking about it, who the power uh, that I start feeling is insane. And it's, I love it, but it's, it's really crazy because I just started talking about it, but it really feels good once you start finally getting it out there and just acknowledging your strength. Cause I ignored how strong I was for so long, just thinking, you know, this is just what I got to deal with. It's nothing like, I don't, it doesn't matter, but it does. And, uh, yeah, I definitely, it, it was definitely such a long process, uh, realizing that it's okay to, uh, not always be okay. Mm -hmm. Wow, man. What an amazing story. It's so when you're a kid, we kind of hit the nail on the head for me is, you know, when you're a kid, you're going through this and you would laugh at people that are laughing at you. How did that make you really feel? Like, do you feel like, uh -huh. Man, these people are my friends, or I'm laughing because I'm gonna laugh, so I'm gonna be part of them. I don't be left out, or what's that look like so for you? Buddy? That's exactly what it was, man. It was exactly that. It was the uh, I'm just gonna laugh so they can laugh it off, and we can just cut it out, like uh, yeah, and just move yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. I was never the kid that, uh, yeah, maybe I should have been, but I was never that super aggressive kid. I was never the kid that liked controversy. Was never the kid that liked being the center of attention. So, with that being said. I would do what I could do to divert the conversation. Ne it never worked. I was always the butt of the joke, but uh, it definitely, it definitely was just the feeling of I want to fit in. I want to just feel normal. So um, it was definitely I definitely struggled with that for a long time as a kid, just uh, wanting to feel normal. And not a lot of people understood that because a lot of people would just look at it as he's being a follower. And in a lot of cases, that's what it was, right? But but in hindsight, at the same time, it was a mask. It was that uh, that comfort that okay, as long as I'm close to these guys, they won't they won't hurt me too much. <laughs> they won't laugh too harsh. They won't talk about me too much. But the truth is, that wasn't true. That wasn't true at all. They continued to talk about me even when I wasn't there. It was just. In my head, I felt like it was better to fit in than to stand out like I've always done. I mean, it's uh, as I said, I've been dealing with this since I was two. So you can only imagine how long I've stood out. I've always stood out in the room and it wasn't for the right reasons, in my opinion. You know what I mean? It was always because look at that kid. He has epilepsy. He may have a seizure or even worse than that. You know, when I was 12, look at that kid. He has dots all over his face. What happened to him? Was he abused? Um, what what went down? And no one would ever ask those questions so I could talk about it, which was which I didn't realize at the moment. But that was like kind of like the uh, what do they say? The straw that broke the camel's back or whatever. <laughs> I was like, that was would would mess everything up because I feel like now that I'm older, if somebody would have asked me those questions honestly and not uh not maliciously, like I was asked those questions like people would say, you look like a uh like a, a spotted leopard or just they would come at me with all these rude names instead of actually asking. Like none of them care to actually ask 
what uh, I've been through. And because of that, I always suppressed it. I did not tell them. I did not explain. I laughed with them or I walked away. I did not. I, I didn't confront it because I didn't have to. No one asked. No one cared. I don't care enough to tell you because you don't care enough to hear. So uh, that's the motto I went back for a long time. But it's definitely uh, the wrong way to go now that I look back on it. And if I would have realized that at a younger age, maybe I would have started talking to more people and maybe I would have had more friends. But truth is, I didn't want to talk about it either. Yeah. Damn. You know, you you had you had those and um, just living through that every day um, in school and around other kids and just kind of adapting to it and laughing, laughing with them so you could fit in and just trying to avoid it and just to move on. Right. So. What happens when you'd come home and you're by yourself? What was the feeling like for you thinking all about all that or, or just thinking about how your day went? Mm. Uh, that's a, that's an amazing question. That was a good, good question. Um, true emptiness, honestly, oh, I man. need to be very blunt with you. It's an emptiness and, uh, it takes it takes questions like these to bring those those answers out because best believe I never fully thought about that right, mm-hmm. but but that's what it was. It's just the uh, uh, emptiness and uh, a moment of not feeling enough, which was a lot of moments. I mean, there was a lot of moments grow, growing up when I would come. There was even moments, to be honest, there was moments coming home where I would just cry. And my mom may not, there was one time she seen it, I think, but there was so many times she didn't see it or no one seen it because I went and hid. But I would just cry and all those thoughts that run through my mind. And I thank God. That's why I say God is such a big part uh, in whatever spirits uh, walk with me. Is They have to be such a big part of my life because the fact that I never uh, thought about committing suicide is only God. And whatever, whatever the universe has for me, whether that be other spirits or family members, I don't know. I'm a very spiritual person, though. I'm not just religious. I'm I'm very spiritual. So I I believe in stuff like that. But uh, I don't know what it was, but I never thought about taking my life, though. As many times as I felt unappreciated, unworthy, as many times as I felt like so much less than anybody else in the world. And I felt just isolated at times and not because no one cared, but because I didn't care if they cared. (laughs) if that makes sense. I was, Mm -hmm. I was just in that dark place, but I never thought about killing myself. And I just looked back like, wow, how? Because I mean, there was times where I just, there was quiet times, right? And these are the worst times because how do you fight your own brain when your brain is the one bullying you? How do you fight that? And there was those quiet times where my brain would be the bully. You know, I would be the one thinking, wow, I'm ugly. I would be the one looking in the mirror like, wow, wow, do I look stupid? Like I would be that one talking about myself. I would be bullying myself. And now that I look back on it, I realize. I may have actually manifested the bullies, if that makes <laughs> sense, because mm-hmm. the truth is my mind was so negative. I was bullying myself. So all those things that people thought was hurting me was truly just just telling me to tr- just telling me what I already felt. It was just confirming already negative emotions. That's why I got that's how I got through it. I got through it because as I'm fighting these people, I'm really fighting myself. So this fight isn't with y'all, even though y'all are talking about me constantly, it has nothing to do with y'all. My inner mind is so messed up that y'all are just confirming it all. So that's all they're doing. They're really confirming it when those people are bullying me. I'm believing it. That's the only reason it's affecting me. And the only reason it's not affecting me as much is because I believe it so much that I don't see nothing wrong with me believing it. So you telling me it, uh, it hurts a little bit because I know I'm not supposed to think like that. But at the same time, it doesn't hurt that much. I can get over it because I've been thinking that already. You just said it out loud. 
So I don't know if that explains it a little bit, but it's like a, a shell you build to where you're your own worst enemy. So nobody can hurt you the way mm-hmm. you hurt. Wow. That's it goes, really so powerful. And you're yes. right about that. You are your own worst enemies. But I think from what I've heard there, I don't know, if Ron, if you heard this too, it's just what drove you to be stronger and motivated you is all those negative things that you've heard from people and the negative thoughts that you had on yourself. But it, that made you stronger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, what I what I heard from uh, man, I, I, I'm, I'm, when you're telling me a story about your as a childhood being picked on, I'm shaking my head because it, it's really it's really sucks to happen, but it's a great thing now. And I'm, what I mean by that is that our world is waking up. And what I mean by waking up is that with social media, podcasts, whatever you want to me, you know, go through out there, your social media is that now we're realizing, wait a minute, I don't have to be like Johnny. I don't have to be like Susie. I don't have to be like Bob. I can be my own individual. Mm -hmm. And Mm because what happened as a kid, especially my group in the nineties, I was overweight. If you didn't look like everybody else, you're the oddball, you know, we're going to pick on you. Just like when you grew up dealing with your your epilepsy, we picked on you because of, well, you're different. You know, it's easy to do that. And it's like, wait a minute, we wake up and see that we don't have to be like everybody else. We have our own story. And we can create our own world reality we want. And we just said right now, honed in on the fact of we, people we meet in our life, are a mirror reflection of us. So those bullies are people you meet. There's a mirror reflection of how you already feel it. It just confirmed it, just like you said. But nine times out of 10, those out there that have an awakening experience or go through uh, mindfulness practice, uh, they go through a lot of different things in meditation. This is when they wake up and realize, wait a minute here. I've been manifesting this the whole time. Like when I would, would sit there and daydream about winning winning $90 million in a lot of what I would buy, I would have these cars, I would have these girls, I would have this, I would have that. I was always broke. Couldn't figure out why. C- couldn't figure out why. Because the idea was is that if I got the $90 million, I can be able to do all these things in my life. That was my idea, my belief system. Now I realize, wait a minute, I don't have to be a multimillionaire to do wonderful things in my life. So I changed the belief. And at the same time, that that wantingness is reflected what I already felt. That's all I was doing. And it was like creating a creator. I was filling it up with all this neg- negativity and all this wantingness and, you know, outside happiness. And, um, dude, your story is, is amazing. Um, it's just... Are you the only one that has epilepsy in your family? No, actually, um, my my older sister has it as well. Um, she she had it uh, later than I did. As far as she had it, I think she got it when she was like uh, nine or ten. So uh, that's when she had her first seizure. But she had she has epilepsy as well. She hasn't had a, a seizure in a long, long time. But uh, yeah, she has epilepsy. I also have a little cousin that has epilepsy. Um, so my uncle, also my uncle has epilepsy now, but, uh, so it's definitely, uh, there's definitely uh, other family members that had it. Uh, I was just always the worst. So, uh, growing up though, it was only me and my sister that had it and my little cousin wasn't around yet. So it was just me and my, and my uncle didn't have it yet either. So it was just me and my sister growing up, but, uh, mine was always the worst though, uh, is where my sister may have only had two seizures a week. I would have uh, two seizures a day sometimes. Wow. Wow. You know, I can't even imagine um, what that was like for your parents. Your mom just watching over you guys and, you know, just being on your side or by your side, you and your sisters, just to make sure that nothing happens or that you're not going to have any seizure. Mm-hmm. And it's it must have been that must have been really tough. And, and I wanted to kind of touch base on when you were talking about, um, you know, being in school and being bullied, you know, bullying, is just had always been there. And to these days, I don't know, I can't even think if it had gotten worse, but so Robert, I work for a school and there's, you know, kids who, what we call or what they see who are different, right? Different from them. And when you see someone who stands out and who are different, usually the ones that you spot that could be bullied. The reason why is because the other kids just do not understand. Right. They don't understand at the same time because they are not, 
being educated to help them understand why this person or this other kid is different from you, why he or she is just just something just someone different not not like a typical kid like you who can walk around or who can run around um and you know i just it it breaks my heart when i see this sometimes and that's why it's you know and I, I love the kids and uh, some of the kids are actually doing um an anti-bullying petition <laughs> at school nice the little ones but it's always the ones that has um some type of um some kind of challenges that always stands out to them that you know, why is she always like that? Why does she always have to do this? Why does she always have to cry? But I always feel like, how do you even tell those kids that, you know, she's, she, she's different. She's going through something. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was ever even a case at school where you have to let the other kids know that why this person is different. But I think even if letting them know what this, what this kid had, mm -hmm. that they could be taken advantage of. Right. And and they may not under quite understand what you mean by different or what you mean or what they have even is. So I don't know. It's, it's really hard to explain to kids what what it is. I think that's another reason I was so sheltered. And so uh, I kept to myself so much as a kid because it is hard to explain to kids that somebody's different. And I think the best way to go about it, though, honestly, is just to normalize being different and uh just remind them that we're all different uh even if you think you're perfect you're not there's we all have problems we're all human we all have flaws but it's how you deal with it it's not it has nothing to do with the flaw itself so you shouldn't judge people for their differences i think yeah i think we just gotta normalize being different because i think we we all we all have this idea of normal in our head, but there's no such thing. So mm -hmm. I think we just yeah. got to make being different okay uh, for for it to be, for kids to be more open-minded, which I mean, 2021 uh, shows me how open-minded kids actually are getting so much more open-minded than uh, I think we like to think. But uh, they're definitely getting closer to a point where I don't think uh, it'll be as hard for people like me going through school, I think it'll be easier to explain to some of these kids because one one good thing about technology is it's teaching them so much more than they would have learned if it wasn't around. So they're a lot smarter than sometimes we give them credit for. It's just, I think it's just about having those conversations with them and letting them know that different is not bad. Mm -hmm. Communication is key and that's where it lacks. At, sometimes that's where it's lacking. Um, I think uh, I was going to say the word definition should be eliminated from the dictionary because the word, the word different means this is normal, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And when we look at people, like look at a thumbprint, like you and I, Gloria, we don't have the same thumbprint, even though we have a thumb. Everybody's unique and as different and as open as we are, they just maybe, you know, have different skin color. They're, they're a little bit taller. They're a little bit, you know, a little more weight They're more muscular, you know, whatever it may be. We should, that's what I think the beautiful thing about technology right now is there, the, the idea of normalizing different is non-existent because now you open up your Instagram or your Facebook. And if you want to find or a group or you want to find someone that has, or um, has something that you find interesting like meditation or um, mindfulness groups, you can find those and get help or at least, hey, wow, the support groups out there. Mm -hmm. Right. There's de yeah, there's definitely a lot of support group. And were you ever, um, since you've mentioned about having a lot of support from your family and people around you, did you ever feel like you were in a, in a bubble? Um, uh, kind of. Um, just elaborate on that for me a little bit. You mean by you mean overprotected? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, definitely, definitely. I've definitely uh there's definitely been times where I felt uh overprotected. And yeah, that, that just goes back to uh, you know, uh wanting to be independent but not really being able to. So yeah, definitely, uh there's definitely been a lot of times where it was just like uh, okay, I got this, I'm good. Even to this day. 
but uh, I'm also uh, the baby of the family, uh, or at least my family, as far as I have two older sisters, and, uh, you know, I'm the youngest, so. And the def- only boy, it sounds like. <laughs> right, yeah, the only boy, so they definitely, yeah. uh, there's definitely that, plus uh, the fact that I have epilepsy, but, you know, it, it, it I get used to it, I guess. Because <laughs> 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 I think even, uh, you know, even as I get older and uh, I move away and stuff like that and my, my career excels, um, I don't think that's ever going to change. I feel like my family's always going to have that extra eye over me just because they know how much I've been through. So I can't really blame them for having that extra protective eye because they, they've seen the whole story live mm-hmm. action. <laughs> it's different yeah. see a lot yeah. so as you've gotten older and navigating through that um what motivated you to be able to talk about it instead of suppressing it uh that's a good question um seeing others go through it and not reaching out uh because i reached out this there's uh one girl um i seen i don't remember her name off the top of my head but uh I seen her on Instagram and she had Steven Johnson syndrome and she, she had just got it. She, and she's older. She's like 22 or 23, I think. But, uh, you know, she was older than me when I had it. So I wanted to reach out to, uh, just talk to her and just see how she's feeling and how she's doing. But I mean, she never got the chance to get back to me, but what she did though, is she sparked something in me. Like, cause one, I really wanted to talk to somebody that that knew about it and had went through it, and it frustrated me that she didn't get back to me and I wasn't able to talk to her. But it also motivated me to uh, tell my story and get myself out there because I was hiding it for I was just hiding it for so long. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Sorry, but uh, and uh, yeah, I just got tired of hiding it. I think. Uh, and I went through uh, recently uh, the court case that had been brought up, and uh, we we went to court a few times for it, and uh, we were denied uh, the trial. But uh, that also sparked it. Like, you know, not only can I not talk to somebody who went through it, and they don't, they're not reaching out. I can't express it, and. But now I know I'm not gonna get anything for it, anything out of it, <laughs> but a story. So that's a whole different motivation when you realize nothing's coming out of this but a story. <laughs> yeah. So when when, you, when that uh, realization popped into my head, I'm like, all right, I gotta stop playing. I gotta stop being scared, and that's what I did. It just I kind of bullied myself into doing it because I'm like, yo, you're being a scared cat right now. You're being scared because you're telling every stranger on the street about it. I was already talking about it before I started making the videos. I was telling every stranger on the street that I would listen. And though they, you know, they act like they care. Truth is, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're going to walk away from this and they're not going to think about it again, especially because it's such a negative thing. It's so, and Clubhouse made me realize how much I really went through in the sense of, I post that picture up there. Um, I don't know if you guys remember uh, the picture I have up there, but uh, I post that picture up there and the reactions are so, so like shocked and scared. I mean, you know, recently I've got different reactions because I think people are getting used to me popping in the rooms with that picture. But uh, the reactions are always just like, whoa, what's going on down there? There's even some rooms where... They've like whole talked about me <laughs> because of the picture. <laughs> but I, I mean, I love it so much because it just highlights the strength in my story because nothing can say it like a picture of this is what I look like. Like I can tell you all day what I went through and how it felt, but nothing is going to make you feel it until you see it because we're such visual people even when we don't realize it we're such visual human beings that when we see something and we hear it it's a whole different level so that's also like that was also a motivation for me to start making these videos it's because i just realized the power of visuals i mean which i already knew but i didn't think of it in my own story i didn't think about it 
putting it into play with my own story. And I also wasn't really sure how how I was going to talk about it. I didn't know how to bring up conversations. So uh, it took me a while to uh, get the courage to start talking about it. But once that, once God just put these signs in my face that I can't hide it anymore. <laughs> it's obvious. Everyone knows, you know, my, uh, my court case, I already put people out that I told people about it so I could get the petition for their signatures. People knew, you know, there was no more hiding. So it was just the decision of, all right, am I going to let this just be all oh, poor him? Or am I going to turn this and make this be my superpower? In a, in a sense, that's what I tell people uh, when they enter my my rooms on Clubhouse. Though, <laughs> you got to turn your pain into your superpower, and I feel like right now that's what I'm doing. I, it, it took me so long, you know. I'm 25 now, but uh, I'm doing it finally, and it feels so good to uh, just get it out. Uh, it just feels like kind of like revealing the inner monster. <laughs> <laughs> Making home your friend, if that makes sense. <laughs> yes, Al, but realize the power of telling your story, right. how it's making you feel and what it's doing to you. Right. It, makes it seems like it's, you're a Superman, right? Superpowers. Yeah. So you said court story. I, I missed that. Is it something in your, in your social media I missed? Or what do you mean by court? Um, court going so court? I, didn't, uh, I put it on Facebook. I didn't necessarily put that on Instagram because Instagram was kind of like the aftermath of all that. Um, as far as my Voice of Scars page, that was kind of like the aftermath of all that. But uh, I, I went to court for it, uh, you know, because they, they did give me too much for my age and my weight. Uh, and that's been proven. But uh, we didn't get approved. Uh, to uh, we we had a hearing for Supreme Court to see if we will, the case will get approved, but it, it didn't get approved. So you know, now we're just back at a uh, square one where we we have to uh, continue to build the case and hope that we get another chance to go to Supreme Court. But uh, I got tired of that honestly. In a uh, voice of scars, I love it so much because it's that breaking point, that point where I was just like ah. I'm done with this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she, uh, you know, she brought me back into reality that she's not, <laughs> that she, uh, you know, she, I deserve something for this. And, and it's not even just that she said, she even was like, it's not even just that we deserve, you deserve this. It's that how much they put you through, they need to pay for that. Like they, they need to feel that. And the only way they're going to feel it is in their pockets. So, <laughs> That that's where my mom was at with it, but I was just at the point where I was like, "Man, I'm done with this. They're not giving me nothing. They don't care. This isn't. This doesn't matter to them. My pain has to matter more to me." So I don't know. I just something in me clicked, and I'm just like, "All right, I'm done hiding. I I'm done uh, telling every stranger on the street. It's time to tell the world. It's time to tell everyone what I've been through and what they did, and what I'm doing about it. Because the truth is, no one really cares what they did." No one really cares what they did, obviously, or I would have money right now. <laughs> I would have went to Supreme Court if they cared. They don't care about what they did. At the end of the day, the question is, what am I going to do? So I just had to answer that question for myself. And we so scores was that answer. I have to, uh, I got to start speaking on it because uh, no one else is able to tell my story the way I am. So let me, me just kind of clarify. So the doctors gave you some medication that was too much for your, your age and body weight. And you guys are suing for, let's say, a malpractice or negligent of what happened. Okay. So, and what happened, you went to Supreme Court, you want to a judge to see if you can go to trial and just said no for a reason, right? So you guys have to start over again. Yes, sir. He, he okay. said no, because, uh, they said the, uh, you know, the evidence, uh, wasn't enough. Uh, I really don't, I kind of blanked that day out, honestly, but uh, yeah, we 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 didn't uh, we didn't get it, so definitely uh, back to square one. But like I said, I'm I'm past that though. I don't even care if it never goes through because uh, no one's gonna care about my story until I, until I do. Until so. you show it, you have to put it out there on the forum. So, what do you want to do for your future? We know about your past. You know you had had it hard. It was rough. Right. You say you got all past that. What are you going to do going forward? What's your future like? No question. No question. Um, a lot. 
<laughs> All right, <laughs> give me that energy, buddy. I want to hear it. Amazing. Uh, well, these are. I'm just gonna give you my I am's right because because I like to speak stuff into existence. So I am an amazing filmmaker uh, and script writer and. At the end of the day, I just want to make a difference. I think that that's what it all comes down to. I want to make an impact in a way that I didn't, I couldn't imagine before. I just want to make a change. So I want to, I want to get my story out there. I want to be a, a world known filmmaker and and just tell my story and other stories of pain because I think a lot of times we, uh, in our heads, we isolate our own story into. Uh, being the only one or being alone uh, when we get in those dark places. But the truth is we're never alone. There's always somebody that can relate and we just may not be able to connect with them. And that's the beauty of social media right now is I can get my voice out there and somebody else is going to talk back. <laughs> somebody <laughs> else has the same voice as me and they're just afraid to talk about it. And my thing was I had to get out of that too. So if my voice can make somebody else not be afraid to talk about it, I don't have any right to keep my voice in. So I, I'm sorry, I got to get off of the question. You better but, not <laughs> keep it in. You better not keep it in. Okay? The answer is I want to be an amazing filmmaker. I am an amazing filmmaker. And uh, I'm just going to get my story out there and other stories out there and make a difference in not just my life, but the people around me's life. I want to make a difference in my family's life. I want to show them a different way of living because I think for so long we uh, we lived to pay to pay paycheck to paycheck way. But uh, one thing I'm realizing as I get older is God gave us all a gift and every single one of my family members are gifted in a way that we just got to tap into. But once we tap into that, we don't need a nine to five. And uh, that's so hard to, to, to get that into your brain because we were so trained to uh, get a job, work day to day, make a living and go on with your life, <laughs> live a mm-hmm. life. You die. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, <laughs> but I, I don't know what it was that clicked in my head, but I said, that's stupid. That's dumb. Um, and I, I'm still, I see my parents working hard every day and they come home and they're tired and we're not doing anything. We're not having fun. I just felt like that's not life. So, um, that's just my why is just my family and, seeing the wrong way done so well. <laughs> I know the right way can be done at least good. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because we work hard and we do it good. I mean, we don't get fired. We, we quit. <laughs> right? <laughs> they, yeah. love us. they love us at jobs. And it's because we, we just work. We just work. We don't even ask questions. We just work. But I'm like, yo, what if we did this for ourselves? Like, I just, that's the question I ask myself. So, that's what drives me to just make everything happen. And sometimes I put a lot of pressure on myself because I do want to give so much to my family and they see it, they see it. But the the funny thing is, is they don't see it how I see it. So I see it as I'm getting there. I'm finally, I'm finally getting some traction. Things are happening. But it, it, on the other side of the coin, right? All they see is me in this, me in the basement working. <laughs> That's all they see. <laughs> all they see is, is me not being around them all the time. All they see is like, for instance, my family was like, because we were supposed to shoot a little skit today, a little goofy skit, you know, me and my brother. But he's like, of course, you got something to do. You always busy. That that's all they see. They just see the busy, 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 and that's right. I am busy, 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 but they don't see the back end. So. Another thing that pushes me is just, I want them to see that back end. I want them to see what I've been doing. I don't want to have to say it because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if I say it because they're not going to believe it until they see me doing it and they see me in it. Because the second I decided to be a filmmaker, right, and I decided to just go for it and not uh, not have a job, but just go and uh, do the videos and all that, they looked at me like I was crazy. But it, it, there was a moment that flicked in my mom's head. Uh, I, I don't remember what job it was that I did, but I was I was working. And there was a moment that flipped in her head. I was like, wow, he's going to do this regardless. <laughs> <It does not. laughs> he's going to do this regardless. And they started, I realized the support level went up, you know, that uh, 
that idea of he's not doing anything kind of dwindled a little bit, but it's still, it's still there. I think subconsciously, I think they still uh, question if I'm doing the right things, but you know, I question that too, but at the end of the day, I feel good about what I'm doing recently. And uh, I'm not going, I'm not going to stop, stop that. So yeah, I'm okay that's, that's with good. all the mistakes I may make. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know what job stands for? I was going to tell you this. You know what jobs J-O-B stands for? No, sir. What does it stand for? Just over broke. So if cool. you ever, if you ever know someone's a nine to five, you ask them, they'll probably say, I'm just paying my bills or I'm just making ends meet. Because having a job, it just means just over broke. You're just doing what you take, what it takes to get by. Right. And that's what it means. And and that's what my, my dad had an old paradigm. You know, his idea, especially coming from the 50s, right? You just have a government job, you're set for life. And that's, those things are old school. Like, they don't make any sense right. now. Another thing, too, is how we're still in this old designment the human body is, is I got to see it to believe it. So once I see the money, so when they see Robert making film and making money, ah, oh, shoot, okay, I believe in it now. All right, mm-hmm. I got it now. What they don't understand, Robert already sees it. Mm-hmm. So that's why he's doing it. He believes it already. So, so right. this new paradigm is that you have to believe it in order to see it is the way humans should be living, not I have to believe it to see it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they also, they also don't see like what you said, the back end of it. So the work that you put in, all the work that you've been doing, you know, to, to get there, they don't see that they, what they want to see right away is success. Uh And once they see success, it's like, oh, wow. But not realizing that, that that didn't happen overnight. Right. And um, yeah, and I wanted to actually say something about the the talents and gifts that you were talking about earlier, how I, I do agree 100% that everybody has some kind of talents and some gifts, gifts that we have that was given to us and just mm-hmm. tapping into that to use it and not just use it to share it with the world. And that's what it's there for. Mm-hmm. Definitely. You know, and uh, yeah, and and I'm glad that you were able to um, to open that up and um, just figure that out, and at such a young age too. Dude, it's amazing. I wish I, you know, me and Gloria were talking about this earlier. I wish uh, I knew what I knew now at your age, but then again, if I was your age, knew what I knew now, I wouldn't be able to accept it. So even if I had the information, what would I do? With, what would I do with the information? Right. So, <laughs> yeah. We so were we're talking about we are where we should earlier. be at at the right time. You know. Yeah. And um, no, it's true. We were talking about that earlier and I thought it was pretty funny because, you know, I was whining about working corporate before too. And, but back then it was just like, we didn't know any better or we didn't know any of that stuff. And we didn't have that kind of awareness that we have now. And um, Robert, I do have a question. So now that, you know, you've figured out what you wanted to do, um, you've tapped into this talent and gift that you have, that you want to make an impact and share to the world. How is epilepsy affecting you now with this dream of yours that you'd like to pursue? It's my superpower now. I'm going to just be honest with you, um, especially now that I, I, I haven't had a seizure for a long time, knock on wood, but uh, it's my superpower all the way um, from everything to, because uh, see, I used to look at it all as all negative things, but at the end of the day, I think way more than a lot of people. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) What I mean by that is my brain is moving 10 times faster than most people's. So those thoughts are coming quick. Now, sure, half of those thoughts are forgotten. But at the same time, I feel like it's so amazing that I get all these thoughts. Because at the end of the day, the few I write down are always amazing. So like, that's what made me start writing and get into this film world is because I just had so many thoughts going through my head. There's so much going up there constantly that sometimes I don't even write my ideas down and I'll just write it down later and I'll remember it just because there's always so much going on up there. So like it, even though, you know, I still got to be mindful of my stress levels and stuff like that. At the end of the day, now I feel like it's my superpower, and not not even to mention the fact that because I've had epilepsy for so long, I am able to talk to a whole different world of people that need me. Yeah, you know, it's not 
or want for them. They don't want me. They may not even know I exist, but they need me in their life right now because they're going through this, these things that I already went through, these things that I've already experienced, and they're new to it. And and when you're new to something, it's so hard. But like I said, with technology right now, they could finally reach out to me and I can finally reach out to them because I need them just like they need me. They may need me, but at the same time, I need to talk about my story too. So I'm not just helping them. I'm helping me as well. So it's just, I don't know. It's just a, it's definitely a huge mind shift that had to happen. So, to get so sharing your story is healing you. And not only you're healing yourself, you're healing somebody else too, who may yeah. be walking a similar path. Um, would you say you're living your purpose now? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I feel it more every day. It's crazy. But, uh, and I just, just to uh, let you guys know, I just started Voice of Scars a, a few months ago. So, Oh, um, so it's new. It's not. Yes. The Voice of Scars is, is a new thing. Um, But, uh, yeah, I'm definitely walking into purpose now, and it's crazy because you feel alive. Ah, uh, super, super alive. I like it's crazy because I thought I was walking in my purpose before when I was doing videos, and I love that stuff. I really do. But uh, I realized that is my uh, that's my passion. That's what I love to do, and I do love it. But that's not my purpose, and. And then I start speaking and I I realize like I always heard the difference, right? I listen to people like Les Brown and uh Dean Graziosi, just different speakers that have amazing things to say. But uh I always I heard them say that a million times, you know, there's a difference between a passion and a purpose, but I didn't hit it didn't hit me until I start speaking about what I went through. And uh when I start speaking, this is this is the one of the funny things God does, one of those funny signs he puts in your face. So when I first put my first video out there on Facebook, uh, just about everything I went through and speaking on it, one of my teachers, one of my old uh, high school teachers, actually, she was a middle school teacher, and she just was like, she commented on it, and she put the love heart, the little heart, and then she uh, put under this is what you wrote when like you know when when you're younger in in school you write uh what i want to be right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what i wrote down i wrote speaker i didn't even remember that i wrote that down and she said this is this is your vision this is what you wrote down and that was just god like duh <laughs> wow. that was like god you know just throwing it in my face that this is what i was supposed to be doing because it does feel alive man i do feel really good and even when those doubts pop up in my head that like am i doing the right thing because like i said uh uh videography was my passion so i was doing it you know i'm still active doing it but i'm not even gonna lie i'm falling short in certain spots Mm -hmm. or it's like not running the business right just certain spots i'm falling short and i'm just like oh man it's so frustrating but i feel good at the same time what's going on Learning. <laughs> i'm so frustrated because i'm not getting things done that i want to do in the right way but then i'm not frustrated because i feel like i'm doing something super meaningful yeah. So I, I want to say, uh, I, I got to say this. I mean, cut you off. But I want to say thank no, you. Good, thank you so much. I'm going to tell you why. So a lot of times, even for us, as we go through this awakening and we start to realize certain things, it takes people like you. So you, to me right now, you showed up in life for one important reason. I, I didn't really think there's a difference between purpose and passion. And now when I saw here, sit here and th think about it or thought about it, I realized my passion is to learn. Mm -hmm. My purpose, because you told me the difference now, my purpose is to help others realize their superpowers and realize their potential. Because what happens for a lot of my life, I didn't realize I had any potential. I, I thought I had zero potential. And it's because I was a, in an unresourceful state. Once I create a more resourceful state, like you're doing, Gloria's doing, I'm doing, we're able to actually get the information we need 
to get what we need to get done. Regardless of how it's done, it's done, right? And so thank you right now. You gave me exactly in my alignment. My passion is learning. My purpose is to know other people have their own personal superpowers. Awesome, man. Thank you. Yeah. And you know what, Robert? You're not just right there. You had just made an impact. Amazing. <laughs> Look at that, man. Yeah. An impact. <laughs> and and you know, and then that's that's just not with Ryan. And this is all the others who will be listening to to this. And like I said, you know, you'll never know who is out there is walking a similar path as you. It may not be on the epilepsy side of it, but it could be just walking on your purpose, like how you're doing it now. And to just mm -hmm. the discovery, discovering your gifts and sharing your gifts. Um, and, you know, like I said, you want to make an impact. Sure. You just made an impact. That's insane. <laughs> Isn't that? Don't you think that God, source, universe aligned us for a reason? For sure. Okay. Absolutely. I got to know this before we end. It can be one to five sentences long. What would you tell anybody listening to this podcast right now? What is the takeaway? Okay. Um, I want this podcast to take away strength. I want you to know that you can do whatever you put your mind to, no matter what you're going through. I want you to know that your pain also hides your superpower. So don't be scared of your pain. Don't uh, hide it. Tell people what you went through and use it to motivate. Um, okay, I want to... Uh, I want to just say, laugh at the doubters, because at the end of the day, that's all you should do is just laugh at the doubters because they're going to be there. In fact, they actually are signs that you're doing the right thing. When you have doubters, when you have people that don't believe in you, just laugh because it is, it is not matter. It is just God telling you you're doing the right thing. And then, uh, just believe in yourself more than anybody else. I don't care if it's your mother, your father, believe in you first, believe in yourself the most, because at the end of the day, if you don't believe in you, it doesn't matter who does, it's not going to work. So, uh, I don't know. That's, that's all I got. Wow. Just, no, <laughs> that's, that's a all, lot. That's, that's a so lot. powerful already. Yeah. And, um, I kind of laugh when you said laugh at the doubters. Um, Me too. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I just didn't want to laugh out loud and cut you off. But I, I, I just thought about something, what I live by, which is doubters, but I use the word hate. So uh -huh. if, I, if I say like, if someone's hating on me, I must be doing something right. Right. And just like what you said, just laugh at the doubters because you must be doing something right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whoo, that was powerful. <laughs> yes, yes, buddy. You feel that? Yeah. See? <laughs> okay. Three things I got for you. First thing is, where can I donate to your organization? Yes, sir. So there's a there's there's two different ways to do that. Um, one, uh, I got my uh, cash app attached to my Instagram. Um, and two, uh, or you could just uh, I don't know how you feel about CBD, but I just recently uh, started selling CBD products. Uh, just to help the people that I'm speaking to, to be honest with you, because uh, a lot of people don't know about CBD, but it is a way to, a non-addictive way to help with epilepsy and a lot of neurological uh, disorders. So uh, that's uh, that's another way. Uh, if you if you know anything about CBD and are interested in that, I have a store uh, connected to my Instagram where you could shop all my CBD products. And uh, yeah, that's that's about it. The, either cash app or a CBD store. Appreciate you. Yeah. Cause I, I yeah. want to donate buddy for sure. I want to help. Second thing is how can we find you? How can, how you can, can our world find you? For sure. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at uh, voice of scars. You can find me on clubhouse. Uh, you can find me under uh, a club named voices of scars. Um, I'm also doing a room at three uh, called Let's Talk Scars, Kings and Queens. I'm super excited about that on Clubhouse. And uh, or you could also find me uh, on Facebook at Robert Kirksey, uh, Robert uh, K-I-R-K-S-E-Y. Awesome. And you guys heard it from there. Turn your pain into superpowers because we mm -hmm. all have a personal superpower. I think I talked about this before in a podcast. 
all of us have a, a have a sound or instrument we have to play. We have to make sure we have to play it to our own tune. Do not play it to somebody else's tune because you are not in line with your superpowers. I want to say thanks, Robert, for sharing your story and empowering me because you just did right now. I felt the energy. Thanks for empowering the world. And if you guys want to be a special guest on Life's A Shuffle podcast, go to Facebook, Life's A Shuffle, and or go to www.lifesashuffle.com. And thanks again for listening. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. having me. Robert, thanks again for um, for sharing your story. Um, very, very powerful. And, and, you know, just everything else that you've shared to us today. Um, truly enjoyed listening to your journey and the story of yours too, from where you started to where you are now. Um, again, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. And to our listeners, thank you for um, listening to another episode of Life's a Shuffle.